Okay, here we are, uh, Matthew for Beginners. This is lesson number four, and what we're going to do in lesson number four is we're going to begin uh, looking at discourse number one in Matthew, and that would be from chapter five, verse one, to chapter seven, verse 29. Now, I hope that you're kind of getting used to our approach of study for the Gospel of Matthew, because it's not your usual, typical Bible class. You, know, you come in, you get some information, you go home, you come back the next week, you get some more information. This is a little more interactive as far as a, a, a Bible class uh, is concerned. Um, you're supposed to read ahead of time the section that I assign, and then on class day, I provide you with the, the headings of that section so you can compare with the notes that you've already made based on your reading. In other words, you read ahead and what you've read, I'm going to comment on in today's class, all right? The class that we're having. Uh, then in the class portion, I'm going to provide commentary and analysis of the text so that you can uh, kind of compare what I'm talking about to perhaps some of the things you may have noted. Again, you don't have to do that. It's just a, a one way of study if you wish to uh, if you wish to follow along in this class. So today, we're going to look at discourse number one, which includes the Sermon on the Mount. You know, discourse, remember we said narrative. Narrative is Jesus went here, He did that, He saw that person, He went over here, He did this miracle, that's narrative. Discourse is Jesus said, and Jesus discussed, and Jesus answered, you know, discourse. So in Matthew, as we said at the very beginning, uh, it's just a series of a narrative followed by a discourse, followed by a narrative, followed by another discourse, and so on and so forth. A very well organized, um, a very well organized gospel. So we're in discourse number one, beginning in uh, Matthew 5, and we'll read uh, verse um, one and two. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, He went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, uh, saying, so we'll just stop there, because that sets the scene for the discourse that's about to follow. So the Sermon on the Mount is a collection of topics that Jesus addressed at this occasion, and it is mentioned elsewhere in Luke uh, chapter 6, verse 17. Luke also mentions the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the setting is a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. I've been there, I've been to that place. Uh, they know where the, believe it or not, they know where the, the place is because um, uh, it is close to Capernaum. And so uh, you know, there's not many places where there's a, a mount there with so many people uh, could gather. Uh, today there's a chapel uh, at, that, uh, at that place and uh, you can see the hillside where this uh, took, uh, took place. Also near the city, uh, or not a city, but the village of Capernaum. And Capernaum was where both Jesus and Peter, both of them lived in that uh, town um, as adults. Uh, Matthew says that after Jesus finished this sermon and teaching, he came down and after healing several people in the crowd, he went straight to Peter's house, and uh, he records that uh, uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was ill, and uh, when she was healed, she got up and you know, made a meal and served them, so on and so forth, just the normal activities that people do. Uh, they are, uh, they're hungry, they need to eat after a long day. The sermon itself, uh, has uh, five major subjects, five major subjects in the Sermon of the Mount. One, the Beatitudes, chapter five, verses one to 16. Two, um, the law, Jesus talks about the law. Number three, he talks about relationships with God, our relationship with God, chapter six, one to 34. Four, uh, our relationship with other people, uh, Matthew seven, one to 12 and then the way of life, or the way into life, or the way to get to life uh, in chapter uh, 7, 13 to 20, uh, 17 to 29. So in our lesson tonight, uh, or today, I'm going to comment on these five areas. Again, I don't have time to read all of these scriptures, and especially this part, pretty familiar to us. You know, we've, we've read this a lot. 
uh, Sermon on the Mount, so I'm just going to talk about the Beatitudes, the law. What did he say? What was the point of all of this? Okay. So we're going to start with the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 3 to 16. The term Beatitudes does not appear actually in the New Testament as such. It is actually a Latin translation from the Latin word Beatitude, Beatitudo, which means to be blessed or to make happy or to be joyful. Okay. Uh, there are nine Beatitudes that are listed and they all begin the same way. They make a promise at the beginning. They all deal with spiritual matters. And here's the important part. The Beatitudes all uh, talk about, if you wish, or deal or directed to people who are in the kingdom of God. That's very important. Okay? He's, he's not talking in the Beatitudes and even in the Sermon on the Mount, he is not talking to people who are not believers. He's talking to people who are believers. It's directed towards believers, okay? Because it makes no sense to people who are not believers, the things that he says. So this uh, Beatitudes was a style of teaching actually that the rabbis used. They would introduce a, a lesson with a question or some sort of paradox, you know, to peak interest, to get people to pay attention. And so the Beatitudes um, were contradictions, actually, which challenged the preconceived notions of life and philosophy. For example, you know, that the, those who are poor in spirit, they're going to get the riches of heaven, you know, the, the contrast. Uh, those who mourn, well, those are the ones who are comforted. Uh, the gentle are those that will gain the earth. Well, that's a contradiction, isn't it? Because in, in life that we see, it's not the gentle that gain the earth, it's the warriors that gain the earth. The ones with the big armies, they're the ones that, you know, that, that win battles and that gain the earth. But Jesus says, oh no, you know, in, in the kingdom of God, it's, it's the gentle that inherit the earth. The thirsty uh, remain um, or will be satisfied. You know how we say the poor get poorer and the rich get richer? That's how stuff works in the world. But that's not how stuff works in the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus is getting at here in these Beatitudes. Now in the Beatitude, Jesus gives insight into the spiritual uh, reality that operates in the kingdom of heaven. So you have to, when you're reading the Beatitudes, you have to understand these are spiritual principles in which we, in the kingdom of heaven, operate. We operate under these types of principles. For example, those who bear persecution in the name of Christ rejoice. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If somebody's beating you up, if somebody's taking your property, if someone's oppressing you, that's not a cause for rejoicing in the world, isn't it? No, you, know, you call out for help or you fight back. But Jesus says, but for people in the kingdom, when they're oppressed, when they're belittled, when they're attacked because of their faith, because of Christ, it causes exactly the reverse. It causes them to rejoice. Again, not a normal reaction for those who are persecuted. Usually the reaction when you're persecuted is fear and anger the desire for revenge. But for those in the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual laws work in such a way that those who suffer for Christ rejoice. Now, it doesn't mean they enjoy the suffering. We're not masochists. You know? we're, we're not looking for trouble. We're not seeking to be oppressed. We're not looking for someone to you know, crush us. But Jesus is saying, when you suffer difficulty and you know that you're suffering it simply because of who you are as a Christian, one of the things that happens inside of you is that you have a sense of peace, you have a sense of joy, knowing that I have actually done something for the Lord. I have actually given or suffered something for Christ. It's a genuine thing that I'm going through and that gives rise to a certain sense of joy and happiness because of what we are about to do and because God has allowed us to suffer a certain measure on His behalf. So disciples in the kingdom 
who are influenced by these types of principles are distinctive. That's the point he's making. Uh, they're like salt. They're like salt that gives flavor to something or light uh, to the eye, which makes things distinctive. So the point of the Beatitudes is the distinctiveness of the disciples who rejoice when they're persecuted and who do these things, uh, so on and so forth. The distinction of the disciples characterized by the principles set forth in the Beatitudes, this is what makes them stand apart from others and what characterizes the kingdom like the saltiness of salt or the brightness of bright and light. This distinctiveness, he says, ultimately perceived in good lives and good works, not only characterizes the kingdom, but it also reveals the true nature of God to the fallen world. What is God like, the world wants to know? Well, God is like the Christian church. <laughs> That's what God is like. The only way that people can have a vision or an insight into the true God is by being exposed to true disciples of that God. Otherwise they can't see Him, right? Can't see God, spiritual being. So the point is this, uh, in the Beatitudes we see man as he is in the regenerated state. You know, you're baptized, you're born again, you come out of the water, you're born again, you're regenerated, revivified, okay? Well, the Beatitudes, living according to the principles of the Beatitudes, that's what their regenerated life is like. Not as I was in my lost state without Christ, but as I am now, born again in Jesus. The Beatitudes are kind of a caricature of what that new status is like, what that regenerated life is supposed to look like. That's what those things are about. Okay, so a little bit of commentary about the Beatitudes. Hopefully if you've read them, that fills in some of the blanks. All right, let's move on. Next he talks about the law, chapter five, verses 17 to 48. Remember what I said, the Sermon on the Mount has these five <coughs> topics that he talks about. So the second topic is the uh, law, and the key verse is in chapter five, verse 20. And Jesus says, again, he's talking to people who are in the kingdom now. He says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this key verse in the discourse, in this discourse, is verse 20 that I've just read, and it reveals that the higher righteousness of the disciples is the quality that distinguishes them and makes them useful in the kingdom. How are we useful in the kingdom? We're useful because our righteousness is a cut above others' righteousness. You know, some people say, oh, you people think you're so good. We don't think we're so good. We're trying to be good. There's a difference. You, know, you think you're perfect? No, but I'm trying to be. <laughs> I'm shooting for it. It's a very clear target that I have. Well, everybody makes mistakes. Yes, everybody does make mistakes, but you know what? I'm trying to cut down on my mistakes. I'm doing it you know, consciously. I'm consciously shooting for the perfection that I see in Christ. I know I, I can't make it, but I'm shooting for it. I know what I'm aiming at. So the section from chapter five, in chapter 5, 17 to 48, in this section Jesus makes a series of comparisons putting forth what they had been taught about the law by their teachers, because throughout this passage, you know, Jesus always says, uh, uh, it has been said, and then He says something, and then He says, but I say to you. So what He's comparing, He's saying, okay, it has been said, your teachers, your rabbis, they've taught you this about the law of God. Okay, well, here's what I'm teaching you about the law of God. And he kind of lays one 
next to the other throughout this entire, uh, entire passage, okay? So the, the teachings that he puts down are the essence and the spirit of the law given by the one who originally gave the law to Moses and that's Jesus himself. And we know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. And you ask, why did he do this? He was doing this because the Jews had a warped sense of what the law actually meant. And so what he was trying to do was to clarify for them what the law of God really meant. So Jesus comments on five areas of teaching in the law that they had received from their teachers. And he compares it with the true essence of that teaching given to him or given to them by him. After all, who's the one that gave the law? Well, God. And who is God? Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying, so who are you going to believe about what the law really means here? Your teachers over here? Or are you going to believe me who actually gave you the law? Okay? So the five areas that he talks about in the law. First area is murder. Murder is the unjustified taking of life. The unjustified taking of human life was wrong. So Jesus says to them, it has been said, in other words, you've been taught, thou shalt not murder. You shall not take an unjustified life. But then Jesus says, but I tell you that the essence or the spirit of this command is the following. He pegs the crime at the beginning of anger and resentment towards other people. And that keeping the law meant a conscious effort at reconciliation, not just avoiding murder. So the Jews thought, many of them, they thought, well, I keep the law, I obey the law because I never have actually murdered somebody. So I'm good on that commandment. And Jesus said, oh, you think you're good? You think you're obeying? Here, let me, let me show you what the commandment really is about. The commandment is really about if you have anger in your heart towards someone, if you have resentment in your heart towards someone and you're hanging on to that, you've already killed them. You're already guilty. So on a, you know, on a continuum, they always put the, the point of disobedience at the very end, the Jews did, murder. And Jesus said, no, 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 let's take the point and let's bring it all the way back here. Here's the point of guilt. Anger in your heart. You call your brother a fool, okay, you're already guilty. You broke that command. You're keeping resentment in your heart. You broke that command, okay? All right, so then he goes on. So you see that this, I'm not going to repeat this over and over again, but this is what he does over and over again in this section. Next he talks about adultery. Now they had been taught that adultery was, in their terms, if a Jew, uh, had sex, if a married uh, Jew had sex with the legitimate wife of another Jew, that was adultery. If the woman was a slave woman, not so much. If she was a single woman, nah, that's, that's good. And if you desired this other woman over here and the model that you happen to have was getting a little old, and you wanted to get a new model, so long as you did things legally, you, know, you wrote out a bill of divorcement and you gave it to her and said, okay, I divorce you, goodbye. So long as you did things legally and then you took another woman to yourself, you were good. So their idea was, I've obeyed, thou shalt not commit adultery. I've never committed adultery. In other words, I have never slept with my Jewish brother's wife even though I may have slept with a slave girl or a temple prostitute or a you know, single woman or something, you know, that doesn't count. That does not count as adultery. So Jesus said, oh, you've been taught this? Okay, let, let, let me show you where the guilt happens. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you're guilty. You've done it. You've broke that command. He, he always pegs it at the very beginning 
of sin. And so the desire to keep that commandment is what? Just to avoid the, the ugly end part? No, he says keeping that commandment is the consistent effort to have a pure heart. Are you perfect? Well, no, of course not. Do you ever lust? Well, sure, who doesn't? You know? So what do I do? I continue to make an effort to have a pure heart. He goes on, vows. They learned a complex manner of making selective vows which they felt they could break when inconvenient. So long as I don't break a certain vow you know, according to the law, in other words, they would do things like um, they were obliged to care for their parents, to support their elderly, you know, no welfare in those days or anything like that. So they were obliged to take care of their parents financially. So what many of them would do is they would pledge money to the temple. The money that they would have used to care for their parents and then they would say, oh, you know, I'd really like to be able to help out with mom and dad, but you know, I've made a pledge, Corban, I've made a pledge to the temple. And then when mom and dad finally you know, passed away, whoop, they would relinquish the Corban and take the money back. I haven't broken a vow. I've kept the law. I've played by the rules. So what does Jesus say? Jesus reveals that vows are not even necessary when someone has an honest heart. An honest heart. The law of God requires us to have an honest heart. Number four, justice. Their system relied on the law as a tool many times for restitution and many times a cover for revenge. You know, you've heard, you have heard, you have heard that it was said, Jesus says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The idea behind the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth was not literally you rip out somebody's eye, you pull out somebody's tooth. It was fairness. If you borrowed an animal from your neighbor to plow and somehow through your carelessness or whatever that animal died, then you had to replace that animal for your neighbor plus some compensation. The eye for an eye idea was that if the animal died, for example, in your keeping, your neighbor wasn't allowed to come over and, 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 and uh, take over your house and all of your cattle. An eye for an eye. You lost a, 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 a one animal, you pay back an animal and some compensation. An eye for an eye. But the Jews, they, many of them were using this as an excuse for revenge against one another. Justified revenge. You insulted me, I go in and burn you down. Well, an eye for an eye, the law says an eye for an eye. Jesus taught them that the higher principle of the law wasn't uh, uh, equal, you know, financially equal uh, restitution, he taught them that the higher principle of the law was mercy, not simply exacting justice or revenge. So the law of justice is the higher road of mercy. God will honor a merciful man, and a merciful man is always just, is he not? Is she not? And then he talks about nationalism. You know, they used to uh, use the law to build a kind of a wall around themselves to keep others out. So their goodness and their kindness was meant only for their Jewish brothers, and many a times only for the Jewish brothers in their village, or only the Jewish brothers in their, um, in their tribe. And they used the idea of the law that forbade them to mix with uh, uh, Gentiles, you know, uh, they used it as a cover uh, to keep others out. And in his teaching, Jesus showed them that one purpose of the law was to reveal God's goodness to men, that to be like, you know, to be like God meant justice and mercy, and especially justice to strangers. 
justice to the, uh, to the alien. You know, here in this country, and I don't want to go off on a political tangent here, but the, you know, the passage begs the question. It was one of the big political problems, you know, seal up the border and you know, deport all the uh, you know, illegal aliens and so on and so forth. And, and a lot of times the argument you know, that, that some people make for just granting amnesty for everybody, just let everybody in is, well, if you're a Christian, if you're a merciful, doesn't the Bible say you, know, you need to be merciful? Well, yes it does, but when the Bible is talking about aliens, it isn't talking about mercy, it talks about justice. It talks about not taking advantage of aliens. In the Bible, what they would do is they would enslave the they would enslave foreigners. And so the teaching was that mercy and love required the Jew to show justice to those who were aliens. And I think you know, if we were thinking in those terms, what is just for those who are here? There's, you know, there's a way, there's a middle way that, that satisfies the requirement of the law but also satisfies the requirement of mercy. You know, a combination of the two. And this is what the scriptures are teaching. But anyways, uh, you know, Jesus is saying to these people, you people are using the law to justify your bad behavior. And I want to show you what the true meaning of the law is. The other thing too is that they were using uh, their idea of what the law was to justify themselves before God. I once had a discussion with a Jewish woman once, and we were just talking about things and talking about religion. And she said to me, she says, I don't need anybody, I don't need anybody to die to pay for my sins. I said, really? And she said, yes. I said, but why is that? She says, because I keep the law. I said, what? She said, I keep the law. I obey the law of Moses, really. So she said, so therefore, I don't need somebody to die for my sins. I have obeyed the law. And I was amazed, of course, this was many years ago, I was amazed that in the 20th century, after 2,000 years of Christianity, that somebody could still have the idea that they kept the law, and yet she wasn't joking. And that was the attitude that Jesus was facing at the time. These people had watered down the law to the point where they actually thought they were keeping it. And in doing so, that they were justified before God and they didn't need a savior. And so Jesus comes along basically in the Sermon on the Mount, and He says, you think you're keeping the law? Let me show you what the law really demands. Bang, 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 bang. So if you're sitting there and you're listening to what he's saying, all of a sudden you start to think, hmm, maybe I'm not keeping the law after all. Maybe I might need a savior. Maybe I might need somebody to help me with this. That was the point of it. The big danger that we do, we take what Jesus is saying here and we make that into a new law. <laughs> We make it 10 times harder for ourselves. We think that what he's teaching here is a new law that we have to, to keep. And if we don't keep that new law, we're lost. Well, no. Jesus is doing exactly the opposite. He's trying to show people that we don't have the ability to keep the law because it is so demanding. Who can go around and never have an evil thought? What person can do a thing like that? What person cannot be angry at times at someone else and want revenge or wants, you know, who, who can do such a thing? Nobody. And that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to kind of soften them up and say, you people think you are keeping the law? You're not keeping the law. You have no way to keep the law. The law is way too difficult, way too demanding for you to keep it. There's got to be another way. And hopefully when people see there's got to be another way, they start thinking, what other way? Well, then Jesus comes along and said, okay, I'm the way. You know when he says, I'm the way? That, that's the answer to this question. I'm the way to be right and to be perfect. Not through perfect obedience. You can be right with God through faith. And if you believe in Jesus, what Jesus gives you, He gives it to you, is the Obedience of the perfect law, He imposed it on you. It's as if you're given, okay, 
It's as if you have obeyed the law according to how Jesus has explained it to you. And how do you get that status? You don't get it by effort. You get it because it's given to you. Why? Because you believe in Christ. That's why. All right, let's move on. Next he talks about relationships with God. Relationship uh, with, uh, with God. Chapter six, verses one to 34. So he teaches them how to have a proper relationship with God in heaven. First of all, he says, practice your goodness toward God with the view of pleasing God and not men. Practice your goodness toward God with the view of pleasing God, not men. In other words, the things that I do, I do to please God. Someone told me the other day, I have a hard job, Sometimes my bosses are very demanding, so on and so forth. I feel a little resentful. I feel I'm not appreciated, whatever. And then it dawns on me that the work that I do, whatever the work it is, if I'm doing it with the view that I'm doing it for God, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I'm whatever, building something, correcting something, managing something. I'm doing it for you, Lord. Now I have to answer to this human boss, this human supervisor, but I'm doing it for you. And Jesus is explaining, this is how you begin to build a relationship with God. It's not all sitting in a dark, quiet place meditating. That's good, meditation is good, but it's not all of that. Because most of us have to put in some hours in the day to earn a living. How does that work that we do to earn a living, how does that translate into building a relationship with God? Well, the work I do, this is for you, Lord. Secondly, he says, pray to God in order to communicate with Him, not to impress others with your piety. And of course, now he's talking to the Jews. Prayer for them had become like a competition, like a spectator sport. You know, who could pray the longest, who, who had the most eloquent words, and so on and so forth, the biggest crowd. You know. So he's saying, hey, pray to God in, in order to communicate with Him, not to impress others with your piety. God knows who you are. And then he, in this particular, that's not all there is to say about prayer, obviously, but in this particular instance, this is what he says. Finally, trust in God to provide for all your physical and spiritual needs. Verse 19 to 34, you know that passage, one day at a time, and God knows what you need before you ask, and so on. That's in this passage here. Basically, trust in God. Boy, it's, it's like one of the hardest lessons in Christianity to learn. You know? It's like learning how to, when you're playing tennis, you know, when I tried to learn how to play tennis, there's a way to serve the ball and uh, it's so counterintuitive. You have to hold a racket kind of crooked and you have to, you know, or golf or any sport always seems counterintuitive. Well, this also seems counterintuitive. We're always thinking ahead and we're always trying to plan ahead and you know, we're saying, God, I really trust you. If you could just put like 25,000 in my account, a little buffer, <laughs> a little cushion, you know, my faith would be so strong if I had a little cushion. And God says, okay, I'll give you a cushion one day at a time. And we fail to believe, you know, we fail to take Him at His word. He says to us, I'm going to give you life, but I'm only going to dole it out one day at a time. And every day that I give you, in that day, I'm going to provide what you need for that day. And what we do is we take what He gives us for that day, spiritual and emotional energy, and we invest that spiritual and emotional energy and we invest it in worrying about tomorrow. What's going to happen? Am I going to be okay? Am I going to be safe? Blah, blah, blah. And so what happens? Well, we've, what we had for today, we've invested it into tomorrow. We don't have anything left for today. And we get into this vicious circle. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if we could learn this lesson to simply live one day at a time and recognize that God will provide for today, our Christian life will be so much richer. So, he encourages them in understanding the nature of the kingdom, the Beatitudes, the quality of life that they should strive for as salt and light of the earth, that is the essence of the law, and how He guides them into the practical ways of how to have a meaningful relationship with God, practice goodness, pray to God, and trust in Him a day 
at a time. Number four, I've got to move quickly now. Uh, relationship with other people, uh, chapter seven, verse one to 12. Well, the, the elements of a proper relationship with God are followed by the key idea to a blessed relationship between people in the kingdom, and that is in verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And so upon this principle is based all the teaching of the law and prophets on how we must treat each other in order to bless ourselves and to bless God. Boy, we teach this to our kids, right? You know, older sister is slapping younger brother around. And what do we say to older sister who's three or five, you know? You wouldn't want him to do that to you, or older sister bites younger brother. What do you do? You bite older sister. Did you like that? Was that enjoyable? Oh, well, you know, if you don't want, you know. We, it's, that lesson is so hard to knock in. But, and then on the other hand, think about this. Well, I'm looking around, I think, well, except you young ladies who are not married yet, but you know, uh, all of us who have children, right? What is the most joyful moment with your children or your grandchildren? It's to see one of your children genuinely helping another one of your children, right? I mean, I could watch that all day long. One of my children, you know, one comes in brokenhearted, something's wrong, they're discouraged, and to see the other child go to them and put their arm around them and say, hey buddy, it's okay, we're going to do it, what do you need, I'm going to help you, you know? Oh, you're going, oh Lord, thank you, that's so good. Can you imagine how God feels? He has to observe his creation, killing each other, and murdering each other, and violating each other. So the last thing you want to see in the kingdom is people doing that to each other. And so the golden rule, right? Relationships with other people are based on this thing. The way you want to be treated is how you ought to be treating other people. And then the last thing that he talks about is the way of life. Having set forth the parameters of the kingdom and its inner workings, Jesus explains the way to enter into the relationship with the Father in the kingdom of heaven. Number one, enter by the narrow gate of Christ. Now later on at His crucifixion, the disciples are going to understand just how narrow and just how difficult this gate is. Why do you say that? Well, the fact that Jesus is the only gate and that faith is the only way, that's why it's narrow. Why is it narrow? Because intuitively, we'd like everybody to make it. We don't want to judge somebody else. We hate to say that person may not make it, because why? Because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. That's why it's the narrow way. There's only one way to go, and not everybody is going in that way. And the hard part is sometimes some of the people not going in that way, they're people we love. I know people who have refused to be baptized knowing that this is necessary for their salvation simply because someone they love has not been baptized. And their thought is, well, if I do it, somehow I'm condemning that person. I know it's a weird way of thinking, but you know, that's why the that's why it's so narrow. There are so many obstacles. It's not just moral obstacles, emotional obstacles. I say to people, hey, if that person really loved you, wouldn't they want you to do what is right? You know, my dad, he died long before I ever became a Christian. Even if I wanted to, I could never tell him what I know now. But I mean, you know, my only comfort is I know that God is just. And I know when God will judge my father and my grandfather and my aunt and my you know, whatever, the people that I love, I am absolutely sure that his judgment will be correct. And even I will say, Lord, that is correct. What you have done is right and good. And it's better that God judge the people I love than I judge the people I love, because his judgment will be correct. That's the confidence I have. Let me just finish up real quick here. He says, also beware of false prophets who produce neither the teachings nor the fruit of the kingdom of God. You know, that's how you know them. Neither the fruit nor the teachings. The true prophets have the fruit and the teaching. So 
you know, I tell people, judge Christianity or judge any other religion by its fruit. What does it produce? So for 20 centuries, look at what Christianity has produced. And I guarantee you, there's no religion that even comes close to producing the good fruits that it has produced. And then finally, don't just hear, do. This is what Jesus says. Act upon them in order to enter in. Uh, you know, he says, many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many hear, and in those days, many heard all of what he said that day, and they were amazed. But only a few entered through the, gar uh, the narrow gate of the cross and faith. Only a few. You know, on, um, in, Acts, uh, in Acts, at the beginning of chapter one, how many people are in the upper room still hanging in? 120? After three years and miracles, there's like 120? That's it. So the, the gate is, has always been very narrow. Don't, all, don't feel discouraged if you're in the minority. Brothers and sisters, we're always going to be in the minority. How do I know? Jesus said so. We're always going to be in the minority. Okay, so that's uh, some comments on what you've read. The uh, assignment, of course, read narrative number two, which would be chapter uh, eight, verse one to 934. All right, thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. We went a little long tonight.